Father, we love you. We honor you, God. We adore you. God, we thank you so much, God, for your kindness and goodness toward us. And Lord, yes, we lift our hands and we say hallelujah. We love you with our whole heart, mind, and soul. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that, oh God, you would fill us afresh, God, with your spirit and give us ears and eyes and a mind and a heart, God, to receive your word. Oh God, I pray that even as I stand here as a vessel for you, that God, you would speak through me. And if someone needs to be saved, if someone needs to recommit their lives to the body of Christ, I pray, oh Father, that you would lead them to do so. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Once again, I want to call your attention to Ephesians chapter 4, and I am going to look at the final section of Paul's words to the Ephesians on this subject of unity. <clears throat> and I want to continue with the thought, one body, and this is part three, one body, part three, Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 through verse 16. We're going to back up two verses to verse 11 and read through verse 16 for the sake of context. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through verse 16. I'm reading this from the New International Version and it reads as follows. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work amen you may be seated in the presence of the lord one body one body Everything that God has created works within a system. Nothing that God has created, at least nothing that I know of, works by itself or works in isolation from something else. Everything that God has created, it works within a system. Take, for example, the earth. There are different systems at work within the earth that allows our planet to function. For example, the atmosphere, the wind, the air, the clouds, the hydrosphere, the water, the geosphere, the rocks and minerals, the biosphere where matter, life, exists. All of these different spheres work together. You can even look at land and look at the crust and the different parts of the land crust and the mantle and the outer and inner core. And if any one of those parts, atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, uh, um, any one of those parts, crust, mantle, outer, inner core, if something went wrong with any one of those parts, it would be like a domino effect on all the other parts. 
it would have some effect because God created everything to work together. Even God, God's self, does not work alone. You read in the book of Genesis where it states, where God says, let us make mankind in our image. Because God doesn't work alone. We know of the Godhead, the Trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And neither person of the Trinity works independent of the other. Because even God does not operate by God's self. And then look at our bodies. Even when you look at the single, the, the single body, the body that we exist in is made up of different parts and different systems. The body that we have is made up of the skeletal system, the muscular system, the endocrine system, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the lymphatic system, the digestive system, the respiratory system, the urinary system, and the reproductive system. All of these different systems are designed to work together so our bodies function. And this might be the reason why the Apostle Paul uses the body metaphor when describing the church. Because what Paul wants us to understand in this concept of one body is that even though we are different parts and we're different people and we come from different walks of life and different circumstances, we all have to work together in order to be the church. That's what Paul is trying to get at here. Paul has been writing and speaking to the church at Ephesus and Paul has been calling for unity in the church. We've already reviewed verses 1 through 6 where Paul talked about Christian living. And Paul says that, that part of achieving unity deals with how we live as Christians and we have to understand our calling and we have to demonstrate the right character and we got to be committed and focused on what we have in common. Then Paul spoke to us about Christian leadership because leadership is important to maintaining or achieving unity. And what Paul told us was that the leaders in the church were given to the church as gifts to the church. That Jesus, the conquering Savior, he took captives and led captives on high. And from those captives, he gave some of those captives back to the church as leaders, as gifts to the body of Christ. And where we concluded last week is where we pick up this week. As we look now in this final section in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul told us that the purpose or the reason for the gifts to the body, the reason for the leaders, was so that the leaders would equip God's people for works of service. Because Paul wants us to understand that unity is achieved not just by Christian living, not just by Christian leadership, but unity is achieved by Christian labor. That you got to work for it. That you got to participate in it. That you got to do something to achieve unity. And that's what this final section is showing us, is that unity is achieved by Christian labor. And we know the purpose of the leaders, the leaders are given to the church to equip. My job as a pastor teacher is to train. My job as a pastor teacher is to develop. My job as a pastor teacher is to help you understand your role to teach enough and to train enough and to encourage you enough so that you find your fit in your place in the body of Christ and understand what you are supposed to do. That's my purpose. But what is your purpose? What is the reason why you do your work? And Paul answers that. In verse number 12, this is what Paul says, that the leaders have been given as a gift to the church, watch this, to equip God's people for works of service, here is your purpose, so that the body of Christ may be built up. 
The purpose for you doing your work, the purpose of you doing your service is to build up the body of Christ. Now, I want you, if you take notes, I want you to underline this word built up because that's one word in the Greek. And that one word that Paul is using here, built up, alludes to a second metaphor. Paul has been speaking to us about one metaphor, which is the body metaphor. And Paul uses the body metaphor in many of his writings. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he uses the body metaphor. When he wrote to the church in Romans, he used the body metaphor. When he wrote to the church in Colossians, he used the body metaphor. And even here in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul uses the body metaphor. But in verse number 12, when Paul says that the work of the church is so that the body of Christ may be built up, that word built up is alluding to another another metaphor. In other words, Paul is saying that the church, in order for you to understand who you are and what you've been created to do, Paul says that the church, has, you have to think about yourself not just like a body, but like a building. Because church... It's not just the body, Paul says, but the church is a building. I'm not talking about the physical edifice. I'm talking about the people of God. Each of us, we are a spiritual building. Paul uses this term built up one other time. He uses this Greek word uh, in chapter 2, and it brings out the building metaphor more clear in chapter 2. And I want you to look there with me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. Listen to the building metaphor and how Paul describes the church as a building. Paul says to the church, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Here it is, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. With Christ Jesus himself, here it is, as the chief cornerstone. In him, here it is, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being, here it is, built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Did you see all of the construction language that Paul used in Ephesians chapter 2? Paul says that we are a building, not a physical manifest, not a physical building, but a spiritual building. That each member of God's people are a part of the spiritual building where God resides. And God says that the apostles and the prophets, they laid the foundation. It was Jesus Christ who is the chief architect that, that gave us the blueprint. Because Jesus told the apostle Peter in Matthew chapter 16, when Peter made that good confession of faith, Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. That was the blueprint for the church. Then Jesus went back to heaven. Then the apostles and the prophets as contractors came and laid the foundation for the church. And now the pastor and the people, we are supposed to be building the frame of the church. And we're supposed to keep constructing the church. And one day, Jesus, the chief architect, is going to come back and do a walkthrough inspection to check on his church where he's going to be looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. Because Paul is using this building metaphor to describe the church. In fact, Paul uses this building metaphor in his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 9 through 17, this is what Paul says, for we are God's, for we are co-workers in God's service. Here it is, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. 
it, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Here it is. Do you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred. Don't miss this. You, not by yourself, not as an individual, but you, the church, together are that temple. Because Paul is saying that we are a building. And there are some people who have right theology, but they got wrong application. Because there are some people who will say, I don't need to be a part of a church and I don't need to be a part of an assembly because the church is not a building. The church are the people. And that's right theology. But here is where they go wrong and that's an application because the people who say that the church is not a building, the church is the people, what they mean by that is that they themselves by themselves can be the church and they don't need to be a part of a group of a, a body of believers. But my brothers and sisters, Paul just told us that you by yourself are not the church, you are a brick. And a brick without other bricks are lonely bricks. In order to be the temple, you need one brick to come together with another brick, to come together with another brick, to form a section, to connect with another section until you form a frame. And that's what Paul is trying to say about the church is that when he uses this building metaphor, he is saying that every member is a brick, a piece, a part of the church. But you need to come together with other members, other people, other believers in order to be the church. You are not the church by yourself. You are not the church when you are individual and you are isolated and you are off to yourself. You need a body of of believers to be the church and Paul I love Paul because Paul is so gifted because in verse number 12 when we come back to our main text and verse number 12 Paul combines these two metaphors the body metaphor with the building metaphor because Paul says that the purpose of the church in verse number 12 is so that the body of Christ may be built up in other words Paul takes body and building and he says that our our function our purpose our role is to be body builders That's what we are supposed to be doing, my brothers and sisters. We are supposed to be bodybuilders, building up the body of Christ. Now, can I ask you a question? How long are we supposed to build this body? How long are we supposed to be in this building project? And Paul is glad you asked. Because he answers in verse number 13. And Paul tells us there are three goals, three visions, three, uh, three uh, objectives for building the body. Strategic planning committee, you ought to be uh, catching this. Because Paul says, here are some goals for us doing this work. Here are some goals for bodybuilding. Because Paul says, watch this. Number one, you got to keep working and doing your work and doing your service until we reach unity in the faith. The faith here is faith in Jesus Christ. It is the faith that deals with what we believe about Christ. It is the one faith Paul has already talked about in verse number five. And since you and I have to reach unity, that means we don't currently have unity in the faith right now. Everybody who's a Christian don't believe the same thing about Jesus. There's disunity in the body of Christ about what we believe concerning the fa our faith in Christ and about what we believe in Christ. We don't all believe the same thing about Jesus and therefore we got to keep on doing our work until we reach unity in the faith. 
What should we believe about Jesus? Well, according to scripture, Jesus is the one who made the world and everything in it. According to scripture, Jesus is the word that became flesh. He was born of a virgin named Mary. He is God in the flesh. He was sinless. He died on a cross. He was raised from the dead. He ascended to heaven. Believing his resurrection and confessing him as Lord is what satisfies God's requirement for sin. We got to believe the right thing about Jesus. And we can't stop doing our work until we reach unity in the faith. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 13, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Then Paul went on to talk about the fact that they were being divided. In verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you say, I follow Paul. Another say, I follow Apollos. Another say, I follow Cephas. Still another say, I'm so spiritual, I don't follow none of y'all. I follow Christ. And then Paul goes on to say, is Christ divided? Because that's what we do in the body of Christ, is we split Christ up as if we have a personal Christ that's my Christ, and you got a personal Christ that's your Christ. But Jesus isn't your Lord. He's the Lord of the world. He's the Lord of everybody. And Paul says, we got to keep doing our work until we reach unity in the faith no matter what denomination you belong to we have to get on the same page and what we believe about Christ but here's the second goal not only do we keep doing our work until we reach unity in the faith but we got to keep doing our work until we reach unity here it is what Paul says verse 13 in the knowledge of the Son of God according to Robert Bratcher and Eugene Nida they state in this context, knowledge implies much more than just simply knowing about Jesus. Here, the emphasis is upon experiencing the presence of the Son of God or experiencing the power of the Son of God. That is to say, experiencing his power in the life of the believer. That what Paul here is talking about is not simply knowledge in terms of education. When Paul says that we got to reach unity in the knowledge of the Son of God, Paul is saying that we got to all come to know Jesus in a personal way. We got to have an experience with the Lord. And it's what Paul said in Philippians 3.10 when he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says that this is not just education that we got to come to understand. We got to have experience with the Lord. My brothers and sisters, you don't have to know much about soteriology. And you don't have to know much about ecclesiology. And you don't have to know about eschatology. You don't have to know about Christology. You don't have to know about hermartiology and theodicy. You don't have to be able to explain the meaning of ex nihilo and the imago Dei and the parousia you don't have to talk about transubstantiation or the substitutionary atonement. You don't have to speak about the Bible in terms of the Tanakh or the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha. You don't have to talk about the paranetic pericope of Pauline literature or the Hoptobrepha. You don't have to be able to understand hermeneutics and exegesis. What you need to have is a personal experience with Christ. You need to be able to have that kind of knowledge that grandmama had when she said, he walks with me. I wish I had a church here. And he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own and the joy that we share as we carry there none other has ever known Paul says we got to keep doing this work until we reach unity in the knowledge 
of the Son of God. Paul says we got to keep doing this work. Now there's a third goal. But before I get to the third goal, I want to ask you a very authentic, legitimate question. Very authentic question. Real question. If we did these two goals right here, reach, try to reach unity in the faith, try to reach unity in the knowledge of the Son of God, let me ask you a question. How long, realistically, do you think it would take for us to achieve these first two goals? No, that's a real question. I'll wait. How long do you think it would take the church to achieve these first two goals? My problem is that there are too many Christians when we got this kind of work to do that's pulling their jerseys off on the field, waving at the fans in the stand and running to the locker room as if the game is already over and we still in the middle of the game. Y'all will get my sports analogy on your way home. If we just did these two things right here, we would have to work until Jesus came back. And Paul gives us a third thing that we have to do. Because Paul doesn't just talk about the unity in the faith and the unity in the knowledge of, of the Son of God. But Paul says, here's a third goal, that our work has to last until there's maturity in the body. Till we become mature. Now let me ask you a question. What does a mature body of believers look like? And I got to let y'all go in a moment. But I want to know what does a mature body of believers look like? I'm glad you asked. Because Paul tells us that too. He gives us five things to indicate what a mature body of believers look like. Number one, Paul says a mature body of believers will be stable. Let the church say stable. In verse number 14, this is what Paul says. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Paul uses the analogy of the body of believers with an infant. Paul says that we will not, if we are mature, if you are a spiritually mature believer and you're part of a spiritually mature body of believers, that you will no longer be an infant, a baby in Christ. My son is five years old. And I can remember when he was a toddler. I can remember when he was three, uh, three months old, four months old, five months old, six months old. And when we were trying to teach my son how to, how to crawl and how to, how to move, and instead, of, and instead of just staying stationary, I remember I would play these little games with my son. I would put him on the ground, and then I would put a toy just out of his reach. And my son would be so captivated by that toy that he would crawl and scoot himself over to get to the toy. And when he just started playing with that toy, I would come and put another toy on the ground on the other side just out of his reach. And then he would see that other toy and immediately lose interest in the toy that he was playing with. And he would start scooting himself and crawling himself over to the new toy. And when he got to that new toy, I would put another toy all the way on the other side. And as soon as he saw that toy hit the ground, he would lose interest in the toy I just put on the ground. And he would turn and he would scoot himself and crawl himself over to that other toy. And what Paul is saying is that there are some people in the body of Christ that's just like infants. That every time a new teaching, a new church, a new pastor, a new this comes out, you scoot your yourself over to that church you scooting yourself over to that pastor you scooting yourself over to that teaching and you need to do what grandmama taught us and get somewhere and set out get somewhere and set out you wonder why you always confused and never understand anything because every pastor teacher in the body of Christ ain't teaching the same stuff. 
And there are some wolves in sheep's clothing. (laughs) You need discernment, my brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not telling you you can't listen to different pastors and you and I'm the only one you can hear the word of God from. No, I'm not telling you that. But you need discernment because there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Everybody ain't teaching you the right stuff. And Paul even tells us in verse number 14 that there are some people in the body of Christ that's full of craftiness and deceitfulness and scheming. They're full of gimmicks and tricks and manipulation. And all they want is followers. They just want you to follow them and they'll tell you whatever you want to hear just so you will come over and be a part of their church and you got to be careful and when you know that God has put you somewhere and given you a teacher and given you a pastor and given you leaders you need to be stable stop running from here and there and that's what Paul is saying here in the text he's saying That number one, a mature body of believers will be stable. Let me give you the second one. A mature body of believers will speak the truth in love. Verse number 15, in direct contrast to these crafty, cunning, deceitful teachers, Paul says a mature body of believers will speak the truth in love. That that when you are a mature body or part of a mature body, you will have people in that body that are not so concerned about you being their friend or having you join their church. They will not compromise the truth just to get you to be a part of their fellowship. A mature body of believers will tell you the truth even if you don't like it. Because they're not interested in you being their friend if they got a lot of you in order for you to be their friend. They're not interested in you being a part of their congregation if they got to always twist the scripture and promise you stuff that God never said in his word just to get you to be excited. They're not interested in that. They will tell you the truth no matter whether you like it or not. But here is the kicker. Paul doesn't say that that, uh, that mature body of believers will speak the truth because Paul knows he's dealing with church folk. So Paul goes a little step further and he says they will speak the truth in love because if it's possible to speak the truth in love it's also possible to speak the truth in hate and to speak the truth in maliciousness and to speak the truth in hostility and there are some people who use the truth as a weapon against other folk you knew that was the wrong time to say what you said You knew that was the wrong tone in which you said it. You knew you shouldn't have said it in front of all those people. You knew that the way you said it wasn't right. But you still did it anyway because you were not trying to build somebody up. You were trying to break them down with the truth. When you speak the truth in love... You do the exact opposite. When you speak the truth in love, you choose the right time to say what you need to say. When you speak the truth in love, you say it with the right tone. And let me say this to some of us. Some of us need to practice before we talk to folk. Some of us, we need to get a recorder and we need to sit the recorder and practice what we want to say to somebody and then play it back and listen to it just so we can hear our tone because some of us don't know how to say stuff to people. It's not so much about what you say, it's about how you say it. You say it with the wrong tone. And then when you speak to people, stop putting their business in front of everybody. This This is why social media messing folk up. Because instead of talking to folk, we want to post about everything. We want to take a video of every situation we've been in. And then we want to put it on social media and post without even having talked to the person you upset with first. I know that y'all ain't come to church for all this. Pastor, I ain't come to church for you to hit me like this. But this is what Paul is trying to tell us. He says a mature body of believers will speak the truth in love give you another one i gotta hurry here paul says not only will a mature body of believers be stable and speak the truth in love but can i give you another one a mature body of believers will grow 
Paul says it, verse 15, instead of instead speaking the truth in love, stop here, we will grow. Now keep in mind that Paul told us that an immature body of believers are like infants. Because Paul wants you to get this image in your head. It is cute to have an infant at three months old, at six months old. It's cute to have that little baby. But 20 years later, if you still rocking and you still coddling somebody, that ain't cute anymore at 20, 20 years from now to be rocking and coddling the same person. Paul says that you got to grow. The body got to get bigger. The body has to get larger. The body has to grow in size. Because God does not want the body to stay small. He wants the body to grow. Nine years ago when I came to this church and I took the senior pastor position of this church, I had, and I'm not trying to say this to shame anyone or put anybody on blast, but I'm trying to expose a, a, a mentality. Uh, nine years ago, I came to this church to become the pastor, and one of my first weeks in office, first couple of months in office, I remember getting a call in the office. I was on the phone with one of our members. And one of those members, they knew, like most of y'all knew, that I came from Eastern Star Church. Eastern Star Church was one of the largest African-American churches in the state of, of Indiana. They boast of over 17,000 members. They have about seven or 8,000 that show up on a Sunday morning. And I, and I was on staff at that church before I came here to, to Mount Pleasant. And when I came here, a couple of the members called me up in the office and they said to me, Pastor, now we know you came from Eastern Star. And we know that that's a mega church. But we don't want you making our church a mega church. If we wanted to be a part of a mega church, we would have joined a mega church. But we joined Mount Pleasant intentionally because it was small and we wanted folk to know us. And I remember sitting in my office dumbfounded. Because I didn't know what to do with that. Are you trying to tell me that if on one Sunday, 500 people came to the altar and said, I want to give my life to Christ and I want to be a member of this church that I'm supposed to send 450 of them away and let the 50 stay here. I didn't know what to do with that. Am I supposed to sabotage the work of God just so you can be comfortable? Y'all ain't going to help me here today. Y'all might kick me out of this church next week, not let me come back. I didn't know what to do with that. I, I had another member come to me and say, Pastor, I, I want to be a part of this church because I want my pastor to know my name. And this is small enough that you ought to know my name. And I thought to myself, I see you once every other month. You don't serve. You don't do nothing in the church. I don't know your name and I will never know your name because the only people I really know are the ones who serve and get involved and do what they're supposed to do. And furthermore, it should not be important as to whether your pastor knows your name. What should be important is whether when you stand before the Lord, he knows your name. And he's able to say, well done, that good and faithful servant. I'm, I, I know. This is my last Sunday with y'all. I'm sorry. I know. Y'all putting me out of here next. Y'all gonna call the meeting on the parking lot. Now nah, we gotta get him out of here talking like that. But what I'm trying to show you is that God's program has always been about his body growing. God has never wanted a small body. God has never wanted us to just remain the same size. God has always wanted... As more, God didn't even create hell for people. God created hell for Satan and demons. The only reason why people go to hell is because they don't want to go to heaven. And God ain't creating another place for other people who don't want to go to heaven but don't want to go to hell. You can only go to heaven or hell. Y'all, God wants everybody to be saved. That's why Jesus came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I'm not going to stop until I preach this gospel to 
everybody who will give me an ear to listen to what thus saith the Lord. Do I have a witness in here? I'm held y'all way too long. But I'm trying to teach here. A mature body of believers will be stable. A mature body of believers will speak the truth in love. A mature body of believers will grow. Paul also says a mature body of believers will be well-rounded. Well-rounded. Which means that we don't just grow in numbers and grow in size, but we grow across the spiritual spectrum of our faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, Paul gives us a few areas that we should be growing in. Paul says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Paul says that you ought to grow in faith, grow in speech, grow in knowledge, grow in earnestness, grow in love, and grow in giving. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 8, Peter also says, uh, gives us a list. Paul says, for this, uh, Peter says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ all of these different areas we ought to be growing in my brothers and sisters here is the fifth and final thing Paul says that we a mature body will will uh, what demonstrates a mature body not just stability and speaking the truth and love and growth and and not just being well-rounded but a mature body of believers will be strong we will be strong my son, five years old, and I keep picking on my son because he's just a God. The Bible says the, a child will lead them. And when you look at children, you, can t you see a lot that teaches us about our faith just by children. My son, five years old, his whole hand can fit in the palm of my hand. The other day, I, I, you know, the other day I was in my house, I was working from home, and I was in my master bedroom and I was sitting on the bed and I was going to put my little laptop tray over my lap and I was going to do some work from home in the bed. And, and, but my laptop, I have, a, I have a laptop bag that got my laptop and books and all kinds of stuff. It's on a, it, it has a handle and rollers, but the bag with all my stuff in it that I needed to work was on the other side of the house. And I'm in my master bedroom. Now I got a one-story house, a, you know, a ranch-style house, no stairs. But my bag was on the other side of the house, and I'm, I'm in the master bedroom. And y'all, when I was growing up, I was my parents' concierge. So now I got a child. He's my concierge. I don't know about, I know I got some older folk in here that can remember. Before we had remote controls, those TVs had them little knobs on them that you had to turn. And when something came on my mama didn't want to rock, watch, I was the remote control. I had to turn channel five. She didn't want to watch that turn to channel six. I was the remote. And if my mama wanted a cup of water, I had to go to the kitchen and get that water and bring it out to her. And, and I had to do it. I had to be her concierge. So now I got a five-year-old. I'm in my master bedroom. I'm laying down. I'm comfortable. I don't want to get up. I call my five-year-old. Well, I want you to go over and get the computer bag and bring it on. That's a big, this a you know, nice size computer bag handle, you know. But the handle, the whole, when you pull the whole handle out, it's taller than my son. And he all in the, and my son goes all the way over and he says, okay, daddy. That's how he, I love, I love his little voice. He's like, okay, daddy. And he runs over to get the computer bag. But in the other room, I can hear my son screaming, uh, it's too heavy. I don't want to get up. So I scream back to him, I believe in you. You can do it. <laughs> and he's screaming from another room, Ugh, it's too heavy. I'm like, I believe in you, son. Keep trying. And as he's making his way through the house, I can hear him grunting all the way through the house. Ugh, uh, he's pulling it. Uh, he, he's pulling it. And then he, he slowly pierces himself around the corner into the master bedroom where I'm laying on the bed. I'm like, I knew you could do it, son. You made it all the way here. He's still grunting and straight. Uh, uh, it's heavy. Uh, it's heavy. 
He gets it all the way to the bed. And I'm like, I'm so proud of you. And he lets out a big sigh. He was like, because <sighs> he's like, man, that's heavy. Now, this same computer bag, as heavy as it is to him, I can roll that thing around with two fingers. It's heavy to my son because he's small. But as he gets older, he's going to get stronger. He was, it was hard for him to pull that burden. It was hard for him to carry those bags. It was hard for him to pull it along. But as he gets older, he'll be able to deal with that bag, to deal with that burden, to deal with that situation. But the problem in the church is we got too many weak Christians that are still babies in Christ. And those situations, you just like my son, Ugh, God, that's too heavy. I can't, uh, God is too heavy. But when you get stronger and you start to grow in your faith, those bills don't bother you. That sickness don't bother you. That trouble in the relationship don't bother you because you built up your faith. And what you used to, uh, I can't carry. Now you just walking and strolling with God because your faith has been built up and your faith is stronger. Do I have a witness in here? And my brothers and sisters, Paul says that a mature body of believers will be strong. Now, I got to let you go because I've already held you way too long. But the next question we got to answer is how do we grow? We know what a mature body looks like, but how do we become a mature body? And I'm only going to be able to walk you through this and not explain as much, but I want to walk you through it. Paul says, number one, as we get to verse number 16, this is what Paul says in verse number 16. He says, from him, speaking of Christ, who is the head of the church, he says, from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work how do we grow well we can only grow because of our connection to the head which is Christ you cannot lose connection to Christ and think you're going to grow as the body of Christ we can only grow because of our service to one another Paul says again, verse number 16, that the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. And I don't have time to break that down, but what it simply means is that every part of the body is supplying support to another part of the body. In other words, we can only grow when we serve one another. I wish I had time to do this the way I want to do it. But I want you to understand something. That when God placed you in the body and God gave you a gift and God gave you a talent and God gave you skills. Those gifts, those talents, those skills were not for you to be put on a platform for you to be, for people to boast and brag about you. But those gifts and those talents and those skills were given to you not for your benefit but for somebody else's benefit. Praise team, worship leaders, when you are up here on the stage, you're not singing for your benefit. You're singing for their benefit. So it's not about the songs you want to sing and the things you want to do. It's about what's going to minister to the people. Ushers, when you're standing on the back of the wall, it's not about you looking nice in your Oxford shirt and your pressed pants and all of that. It's about the smile you put on your face. Even if we can't see it through the mask, we ought to feel like you're smiling. And you ought to, it's about the greeting you do when folk walk through the door. It's not about your benefit, it's about their benefit. Deacons. I know you sitting on the front row and you're looking good and we got you on stay. Everybody know you a deacon because of where you sit. But you're not sitting on that front row for us to applaud you or for us to think that there's something good about you. But you are there because you want to be ready to move and serve and be with a support for somebody who is in need in the congregation. It's not about your benefit. It's about their benefit. My brothers and sisters, my gift is for you. Your gift is for me. That's what we have to do. And I'll leave you with this because I could go on 
and I can be here. I could be, you know, really, if I had it in me, I could be like Paul. Paul taught all day. Somebody, Paul taught so long, somebody committed suicide. They just jumped, man by the name of Eutychus just jumped out the window and said, I can't take no more of this. <laughs> He just, I'm, I'm done, Paul. You preaching too long. And Paul, Paul's such a bad boy. Paul went down. Eutychus was laying dead on the concrete. Paul went down, laid hands on him. Eutychus was revived and brought back to life. Then Paul brought him back up and kept on teaching from nighttime to the morning. I wish, y'all, I, I, I know I can't do y'all like that. I know I can't do y'all like that because y'all ready to go now. But I love teaching. I'm, I wish I'd get back to them Paul day, but I don't care how long we got to be here. We're going to get this word today. Get it in our spirit. Get it in our soul. But, but, but Paul here, I got to give you the, one other thing, and I'll, I promise you I'll leave you alone. We can only grow when we serve one another. We can only grow because of our desire to love one another. Because Paul says in verse number 16, he says the, the joints are held together by every supporting ligament as it grows and builds itself up. Watch this in love. Because that's my motivation. And finally, we can only grow because of our full participation in doing the work. Verse number 16 again, the very last phrase says, as each part does its work. That means that everybody has to get busy doing something. I want to do this last little illustration and I promise you I'll leave you alone. Imagine for a moment, look at this body. I know it ain't in the best shape. Just look at it for a second. I got two legs. Imagine if my left leg had a mind of its own and said, you know what? I don't feel like working and being a part of this body I ain't doing nothing. So now, all the work of standing has to be on my right leg. Because my left leg said, I ain't doing nothing. You have to do it all by yourself. And imagine the goal is to get this body to that podium. But my left leg said, I ain't doing nothing. So now the only way I can get to that podium is on one leg. I mean, I got to hop to get to that podium because my left leg said I ain't doing nothing now the thing that's so crazy about this jacked up insane dysfunctional leg is that this jacked up crazy dysfunctional leg is connected to the same body as the one leg that said okay I'll do all the work and the jacked up dysfunctional leg got to get to the same place as the leg that says I'll do all the work. But the jacked up dysfunctional leg is not going to get there any sooner than the one leg that decides I can do the work can get it there because now all the stress and all the burden is on that one leg. But now imagine if the jacked up leg came to his senses and said, you know what, I'll help you do what you got to do. How much quicker we can get to our purpose and our goal and what's wrong with our churches is we trying to do the work of God just like this this is how we trying to do the work of God but imagine what we could do if every part of our body was working and doing what we were supposed to do My brothers and sisters, I'm not interested in you jumping and running all over the sanctuary. I'm trying to teach and get this word in us today to help us to understand that we are one body and we need each other. Well, I hope this experience has inspired you, but it's not enough just to be a hearer of the message. You also have to respond to it. And there's two ways to respond. First, you need to receive salvation. If you are not a believer, it is very simple to become one. I refer to it as the ABCs. F admit that you are a sinner. What does it mean to be a sinner? Well, it simply means that we've all done wrong and all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we do this on a regular basis. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That literally means eternal separation from God. 
But God has given us a free gift and that gift is eternal life, which brings me to be, which is to believe, believe in what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Jesus took our place for sin. He took the punishment for our sins that we should have taken and he died, but he was raised from the grave. And if we believe that Jesus died and was raised back to life and put our whole heart and trust in that, then the next step, the letter C is to confess. Confess Jesus as Lord, which means that we are giving our life over to Christ that he will now be in control and he will be our Lord. And if you do those three things, admit, believe, and confess, you will become a Christian, a believer, a child of God. If you've already done that, then perhaps you need to become a part of a Christian fellowship. And you can do that virtually if you live in some other part of the country, or you can become a regular member of our church if you live in the city of Indianapolis. Here is what you need to do. There's information now on your screen, a phone number and an email address. Why don't you reach out to us and let us know about your decision to receive Christ or your desire to become a part of this fellowship and we will reach back out to you and get you connected. I again want to thank you so much for being a part of this experience and I hope you would join us again soon. Until then, be blessed.